Hey everyone, this is our lesson on pedigree analysis, so understanding pedigrees, and we use pedigrees to help us with these offspring ratios for inheritance patterns. So Punnett squares uh, work well for organisms that have large numbers of offspring uh, and controlled mating, but humans are quite different, okay? So we have small families, even large human families have 20 or fewer children, which mm, that's a lot. Uncontrolled mating, so they're often he like heterozygotes because we, you know, aren't kept in a box and told we have to mate with one person. We get to pick our mate. And there's failure to truthfully identify your parentage sometimes. Um, sometimes people don't know their parents. So you don't, you can't use a Punnett square if you don't know the genetic makeup of the parents. So that's why we use pedigrees for uh, like human family trees relationships. And there are basic symbols to know here. So we use circles and squares mostly. <laughs> and we color them and that kind of tells us what we need to look at. If the circle or square is not colored in, then that's an unaffected human. If they are colored in, that is an affected. Squares are male and females are circles. If we don't know the sex of whatever we're looking at, um, especially like, you know, if, if you're trying to determine if an offspring will have a certain genetic disorder or anything like that, you don't know if they're going to be a girl or a boy yet. So you just kind of can put a diamond there for that. And then if someone has died in the, in the pedigree, you just put a line through them. If you are connecting people, so almost like a family tree, like I said earlier, uh, you would draw one line between, which means that they're mating. Two lines mean, <laughs> again, I'm sorry, I struggle so much with these words. <laughs> Consenigiguous, I can't even say it, mating. And then if you branch off from that mating bond um, to more circles and squares, that would show you the offspring. So pedigrees will show you how a trait or disorder is passed from one generation to the next. So you can continue these with generations. You can do parents, children, grandchildren, and keep going from there. Remember, squares are males and circles are females. Horizontal lines connect breeding couples. Vertical lines connect parents to children. Shading means the individual has the trait. No shading means the individual does not have the trait. Half shading or a dot within means that they are a carrier. And then a, di a diagonal line means death. Roman numerals will show generations and you tend to write those down the side of your pedigree. Numbers are assigned to individual in a generation. So pedigrees with half, sh half shading will show carriers. So you can see it'll either be half shaded or you'll put a dot in the middle. And we have this couple here where we have an affected male and a carrier female. If they mate together and have children, once you know the gender, they had one male that was not affected, which means um, whatever they're looking at has to be a sex-linked disorder because she has one X that is affected, one X that is not. He got the X that is not. The other male got the X that was Dad was affected, so his ex was, which means he's recessive. He is going to be affected. Then we have an affected male and a non-affected female. So a pure, I guess, female, not a heterozygous. You're going to have two females that have the um, carrier gene, but the male will not be a carrier because he gets the ex from the mother. And this is generation one up here with the parents, generation two, and then generation three. And um, these are two different families who then combine together to, um, you know, their offspring mated. And then that's how it kind of branched off here. So as you can tell, this circle is not bound to anybody else. That circle means it married into the family. Okay. How to construct a pedigree. So these are visual showings of patterns of inheritance for a trait. Um, we know our symbols here. Okay. And then you link parents together with a line and then vertical line to connect them to offspring. 
autosomal dominant pedigrees. So we would draw a pedigree showing a cross between a heterozygous parent and the two boys and two girls show all the possibilities. So we're, we're going to draw one of those. We've got the genotypes of the affected and the unaffected. So affected, since this is dominant, would be anything with a capital letter. Only lowercase letters are not affected. And these are heterozygous parents, which means they are both affected because they would be capital A, lowercase a. Okay, you draw a line between them down to their four offspring. Okay, um, since they're both heterozygous, you would have three that are affected, but you would have 25% that would not be affected. Okay, and we just showed that it was the boy there for this one. You could also then um, two heterozygous parents. Oh, yes. So they're heterozygous parents, which means they're a carrier, but they're unaffected um, because they have that dominant. This one, I didn't even read the title. This is recessive, so they're not going to express it, but they do have the gene carried. So you would half shade theirs. And then four children, two boys, two girls. One boy is going to, since it's recessive, um, one boy will not express, the second boy will not express, the girl will not, ex one girl will not express, and the other will not express because they should all be, oh, just kidding. Yes, so one will ex one will express and two will carry. Because you should have, since they're both heterozygous, you'll have one completely unaffected with both capital A's. All right, and then sex linked, remember we have to write the X's and the Y's here. Um, two boys, two girls, normal male, carrier female. Um, so that means since the male is normal, capital R would be normal. Again, it's recessive, so you have to have that. Female would be half shaded. Two boys, two girls. One of these boys will be affected because they'll get the lowercase r from the mom. One will not be affected because they'll get the uppercase r. One girl will be not affected at all because she'll have both uppercase r's. And one should be um, a carrier because she'll get the uppercase from the dad and the lowercase from the mom. So interpreting these, you can determine if a trait is dominant or recessive. If it skips a generation, then it would obviously be recessive. If you see it present in every generation, it is dominant. Is it autosomal or sex linked? If it affects um, males and females equally, then it's autosomal. If it affects males more, then it's sex linked. Females tend to carry the trait but are not affected by it and they affect their sons with it. And then females get the trait from affected father and carrier or, or carrier slash affected mother. Affected males got it from their mother and give it to their daughters to carry. So if you look at this, I want you to pause this video after I read these and try these questions. So is this autosomal or sex linked? Is it dominant or recessive? And assign the genotypes to the pedigree to show the inheritance pattern. So I want you to try that really quick. All right, so again, pause the video and try this one. Remember lines that are through them that it has it on here on this chart. So pay attention to that. All right, so pedigree analysis. Generations are indicated by the Roman numerals, one, two, or three. So you say we number those down the side. Within the generation and are then marked with just regular numbers. So one and two, you just basically you write all the way across left to right. So pedigree questions. This pedigree does not indicate carriers. So what um, sex is the individual in generation one, number two? So you see it's square. Um, that should be a male. How many children are in the second generation from the union of 
one one and one two. So you should see you got three there. What are their sexes? You've got two girls and a boy. Which individual was married in generation two? The boy. How many daughters are in generation three? You should see two. How many sons are in generation four? You should see two. List the individuals who are afflicted with sickle cell anemia. Obviously, those are the ones that are colored in. Were individuals uh, I one one and one two carriers? Um, well, they would have to be if it is expressed on one of their children. Okay. How do you know? And then list the carrier and it lists other carriers of sickle cell anemia. So you can go through and you can try that. Now let's talk about karyotypes. <coughs> We've seen these before in the past, but we're going to talk about how you kind of label these a little bit. So this is an organized picture of a person's chromosomes. Okay. Remember to look down here at the 23rd chromosome to determine the gender. So this one has two X's. What would that be? This one has an X and a Y. What would that be? Remember that the autosomes are the first 22 pairs. And then the sex chromosomes are the 23rd pair, which should not look anything alike. They will be labeled XX or XY. When you write a karyotype, like the name, I guess you could say, of a karyotype, you'll put the total number of chromosomes. You'll put the sex, XX or XY, and if it's missing a chromosome somewhere, you'll put minus and that number or an additional chromosome number. So if you have more, you'll put them there. So as you can tell, this person has an extra one on chromosome 13. So it would be 47 because there's 47 total. Normally you have 46. XY because it's a boy, because you can tell here plus 13, which means you have an extra one on 13. Okay, so if you write this one, it would be 47 XY plus 18. Okay, an extra 21, 47 XY plus 21. Here they have an extra X, but also a Y present. So you would write 47 XY plus X, you could also write here 47 XXY. Okay, you can do either one of those. Both would be correct. And then the most common genetic diseases is if we have a missing X, which shows us Turner syndrome. So this would be 45X minus X because you can't write XX.